Welcome to Hopkinton Coffee Break, your home for current community talk with Patricia Dewart, Darlene Hayes, and Connie Wright. Hello there. Welcome to Hopkinton Coffee Break. We are so excited. This is the morning of the new library opening. We cannot wait to see inside at some point, but we are particularly excited to have our state representative, Carolyn Dykema, with us today. We're so happy to have you here to I'm take so some to time be to be with us on this special day for Hopkinton. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Looks absolutely beautiful. Doesn't yeah, it? Remarkable. Oh, we're the giddy. Old, the blending of the old with the new. And saving the chapel and using way it they for did the meeting it. room yeah. and stuff. Oh. It's spectacular. So and we'll get to see you soon. You actually played a role as advocating for this building. We did. So yeah. there's, there's a library program through mm -hmm. the state that the town went through. So um, we facilitated those conversations. And of course, we wrote letters of support to make sure that the town was considered. And, yeah. you know, the town just did a great job putting together the proposal, which um, was a no brainer in my view. So just glad to see it have come so far. And to see this remarkable opening is a, a real something the town really can be yeah. proud of. Absolutely. It's, so it's cool. been a long time so coming. Cool. You know, previous conversations with um, the library director, I mean, it's been in the works for 10 years or more, so the idea of a new library and the advocacy for this. So, yeah. you know, being a part of that and, you know, Thank we're you. so wonderfully supportive to your district. We're, well, we're you know, so I have a great district, and I have to say, you know, I want to just um, yes. recognize the community because at the end of the day, it's the community that decides to step up and invest in something like a library. And, you know, libraries are they're taking on a new role mm -hmm. in the yes. communities. And I think some people perceive libraries as a place where you go to get books, mm. you know, but libraries are really a community um, gathering place. I mean, look at the fact that we're here today. You see mm -hmm. parents, you see um, you know, seniors come to the library, and um, that's really uh, important. You know, I think I just recently heard a thing on NPR. The Surgeon General was talking about isolation, social mm -hmm. isolation, mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and how that's connected to things like sub substance abuse and sure. you know depression. Even and this is and you know, aging is issues. Yeah, and to have a place where you feel connected. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's a lot of foresight on behalf yeah. of the town and its residents. So back Absolutely. up a little bit because I know we know you really well. But and we're filming on location, so there's noise, guys. <laughs> but. Um, T you know, you're pretty local, town next door, Holliston. What were her favorite? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Let's, every town is my every favorite. Every town yeah. is my favorite. <laughs> every town is my favorite. But a little bit about yourself and um, and then things going on at the State House. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I live in Holliston with uh, my family. I've got three kids who mm -hmm. I'm bordering on empty nesting. So yeah. Wow. I've got two kids who are out of school and, and um, the real world, as they say, and then mm. I've been, my youngest is a junior this year, so wow. he's starting to, to look at the college. Wow. He just got his driver's license. He yeah. just got his driver's license, which makes a, a big difference for me, day to day, <laughs> I tell you that. That's a big change. I can't say you're about to be an empty nester, because she's about to have her youngest Last go to college, to but, yeah. but everybody still is home on weekends. Well, so they keep yeah. saying they come back, right? right. They graduate, then they come back, and so you get them again. Well, a couple weeks ago, you actually went and visited your daughter at... Uh, um, her she's college. down in Florida, down in Miami. And, oh, wow. Um, that was probably like your first parents weekend. It was. And so, did the I, whole family go? It was great. Uh, no, it was just uh, myself. I just mm -hmm. went down there. Oh. Because my, my older son is down there as well. Okay. And oh, same so school. And my daughter. Oh, wow. They're both uh, at the same no, school? No, he's actually working down there. Oh, he's wow. Okay. He's okay. my uh, wow. kid yeah. making, making money and doing really well. Awesome. And, you know, yeah. my, my standard is can they pay their own way and pay their bills and he's paying his bills. So I think that's Hey, that's commendable it, it's really on any level. For him. Yes. Yeah. To you know own what? His future and, mm -hmm. and kids good for need him. to do that and need to. Yeah. Exactly. It's good. good. It's good. So, yeah, so my husband and I have been in Holliston for about 22 years now. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I uh, loved it. I started in local government, like many yep. folks do that work in. Um, you know, well, you and I met on Karen Spoka's campaign. That's right. I was involved. That was my first entry into statewide politics was I was a town captain working for Karen yeah. in Holliston. Yeah. And she won and the rest is history. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to back up still back to Miami because um, your daughter started off school in a kind of unique way this year. Oh my God. Yeah. And you know with the hurricane hitting there was oh, wow. a lot that happened <laughs> there. Evacuate. Yeah. So children have evacuated. Tell us the story. She's been down there for about two weeks mm -hmm. and was just starting to settle in. But you know kids when they go up they start to go through the homesick period. So just as she was starting to get a little homesick, a hurricane warning 
Mm. So they ended up canceling school for two and a half weeks. So she came home wow. for two and a half weeks and she just went back a couple of weeks ago, I guess. Wow. And when we went down, I was, you know, I guess they, obviously the Miami area didn't get hit as much as they had expected it to. Right. Um, but they still had a tremendous amount of debris, a lot of tree debris that was all piled up and hadn't been picked up. I was yet. just so there last week checking your mom. my mom, who's 92, right. and she's she had evacuated. She's on the other coast, and they did Which get hit harder. Mm. Yeah. Now, you seem to make a habit of evacuating those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know your older son had to evacuate this storm. And then was it like last year that the two of you had to like run across the state evacuating That's from right. another we, storm? We did. We evacuated during Hurricane Matthew, which oh was really... God. So it's like... Was was devastating not for for um, Florida as much, but they expected it to. They thought yeah. it was going to be a direct hit, and I was scheduled to go down there to visit him anyway. Had to move my flight up because I ended up getting the last flight on Delta, I think, mm, that went down there down. before the hurricane. Oh my god! And we went down, and um, so I picked him up, and we got in the Great. car at about eight o'clock at night, and we drove across the state. Wow! And all of the um, hotels were full. We couldn't get a place to stay, so no we were in room the car, at the end. No wow! <laughs> We were about ready to sleep, <laughs> sleep in the car. Like, can we sleep on a beach? Yeah, no, what, what do we, we do? do? <laughs> so we ended up getting a room at the last minute, and then which, we had to get another night. To? We camped out in the lobby, waiting for someone to call and cancel so wow. that we could get the next. Where'd night. you drive to? Uh, Naples. I, I wish I knew. Because, well, I could have stayed with my mama. She was too. <laughs> and then she would have had company. <laughs> it would have been a win-win. Well, you guys have first-hand experience with disaster. Wow. I mean, really. <laughs> well, it just feels so fortunate that, you know, we, we missed it. We missed yeah. the yes. tips. But yes. when you look at oh. what's happening in, in know, Texas yeah. and... Um, some of these islands. It's oh, really and California. And, and and Puerto Rico still doesn't Puerto have Oh my wild. God, that's it's a actually heartbreaker. actually a couple of families moving here from Puerto Rico oh. last oh. night and today. Really? Um, that's I good mean, to know. I mean, one of the women in um, the, our community came by my house last night and picked up like a whole bed frame. She's coming mm -hmm. by tonight to pick up a mattress. Um, that they, they have nothing. And I, another family was able to kind of bring them in. They found housing and there's a couple families moving in. I'm actually working with a few people who are relocating here interim they're hoping it not to be long term mm -hmm. but they realize this could be a year or two and i'm helping them gain employment exactly and, do, and possibly we even work for my my firm because i think about that in terms of bilingual skills and the talents you know it's almost like i mean it's a terrible tragedy that people have to be CBAs. relocated they're but the great. idea that you know we always look for in, in the u.s i mean not that they aren't part of the u.s but you know on the mainland if you will bilingual professionals and you know what an opportunity to yeah. bring people in who you know who have skills that are needed, who have skills yeah. that are needed? Yeah. absolutely so if I could put you know, a silver shameless, lining shameless plug there's Please actually do. an event tomorrow at nine nine two four i believe in southboro at the senior center where they're doing a collection drive for oh yes um Puerto supplies Rico. to send to Puerto Rico, yep. and there's a list on my Facebook page of all yes. the supplies that they're looking oh, for. Oh, good. We'll so put I'll that be over up. there tomorrow. Yeah. And well, and, um, and another shameless plug, you the, have um, office hours once a quarter, and it gets posted on HCAM, and you're available to meet with people. Um, right. So one, one of my you know, commitments that I made when I first ran for office is that it's it's really important to me that, that people feel like their voice is heard, and it's part of my job is to make sure that I don't wait for the phone to ring, but mm -hmm. I can reach out into the community and make sure that I understand what folks are interested in and what's important to them. So um, since I first got elected to office, actually, or to right back in uh, 2009, um, I've had these quarterly office hours once in every community. So um, it's always posted on my website, and I really encourage people to come down and just, you know, they can share concerns or thoughts, or, you know what, just come down. If we haven't met before, it's a great <laughs> opportunity to meet you. Yes. So... What's, What's going, going on? on? What's new? <laughs> What's new in your neck of the woods? <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on at the state house. Um, we recently passed um, some legislation in the house, which has gone to the Senate on the bump stocks, which are firearm oh. firearm accessories. Oh right, thank you. Oh. To thank the, you. Um, All Las except for Vegas. three reps. That's right. There were yeah. there were three legislators yeah. that voted against it in the house. Um, but a hundred percent of the Senate voted. Um, the Senate is, is has their own bill yeah. that they're working on, yeah. so that kind of gets worked out yeah. through the legislative process. But, you know, the whole um, idea that, that this particular type of equipment that was added to a firearm essentially made it into an it's assault a, weapon. Uh, yeah. It Automatic. the rate of fire. Mm -hmm. And there's been a tremendous, even from folks in the community that are big Second Amendment supporters, mm -hmm. um, recognize that this type of... of 
you know, accessory is really um, over the unnecessary. Top. Something that we over need the to top. better control. Yeah. So that's going on. Um, that's in process right okay. now, actually. And um, one of the other things that that folks often hear my name associated with is the bees. Yes. So tell us about that because I did not know about, about that. Yeah, I know one yeah. was just circling around our heads a so, moment ago. <laughs> um, one of my uh, focuses since I've been in the legislature is environmental issues. That's really mm. where my uh, a lot of my passion lies. And back several background years ago, too. and my background, right? I have a background in, in um, you know marketing for a civil and engineering firm mm -hmm. and doing some toxic mm -hmm. waste site cleanup. But um, biology, I come from a science family, so oh, okay. I always have kind of a, a, an eye for all things ecology. And it was brought to my attention by my local AGCOM that there were these pesticides. What's AGCOM? Um, agricultural Commission okay. yeah. in Holliston. We have a very active Agricultural yeah. Commission in Holliston. And they had raised this issue of these neonicotinoid Neonic pesticides Gosh. that are designed, they're actually absorbed up into the, the plants. Paint. Yes. And they're intended, so insects that eat the plants ingest these um, insecticides mm. and they die. die. Mm -hmm. which is how they're designed but unfortunately it also goes up into pollen, the, the flower. pollen mm. and you know when the bees and the pollinators feed on these plants they ingest the same pesticides that and it kills them, and it kills them. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it clearly kills them in high doses but you know the question is how much can they absorb and not be affected and there's a lot of science going on around it mm. but while the science is debated I, there's no debate that that these pesticides in a certain quantity harm insects. So my bill would essentially limit the use to only licensed pesticide users mm. um, until we get a better handle <coughs> on, you know, how much they can absorb safely. Well, and, and it's insidious. You Thanks can go and purchase a plant, and unless you're aware of this issue and you look at the fine print on the plant to know if the plant has been treated with it. And they're mm. not all labeled. Even I know. in the fine print, they're not yeah, all labeled. And, and so, you, yeah, you, you have to go an extra year. And so you don't even know. Here are you thinking, oh, I'm planting a butterfly bush. I'm going to be helping the butterflies and the bees right. and everything. And you're killing them. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very, that's it's really more involved more evidence, in that. Yeah. Um, showing that, yeah. that there's real concern yeah. about this. And my, my bill has actually gotten a tremendous amount of legislative support. A lot of the um, commercial groups, actually, um, Mass Nursery and Landscape Association and Mass Flower Growers are supportive of the legislation. So we're making some steady yeah. progress. Well, and then you've also done something that has been near and dear to me, which is um, the right to release of lab animals once the laboratories are finished using them. Up until now, labs just destroyed them. And it was difficult negotiation to get them to release these animals and you met my foster a couple of years ago I fostered I a beagle who was released from the lab and he was a sweetie and, and it just breaks your heart to think he was going to be euthanized mm -hmm. um, and so you sponsored a bill that's going through the process that it's part of a big bill um, that will require the laboratories in this state that when they're finished with their testing of these animals that they allow people like me to foster them, rehabilitate them, and Adopt they make great, the great so pets. Is it all animals or just pups? Or what are we talking about um, in terms of animals? It's just mm -hmm. dogs and cats. Okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, which yep. You know, are, is a big step forward. Yeah. And, um, and to give credit to some, some of these organizations are already, you know, yes. adopting animals out, but this would really create a consistent statewide yeah. framework for doing it and making sure that they're, um, you know, medically appropriate to be right. adopted. And well, that kind of and, and that's the whole point. You know, clearly if, uh, if an animal has something communicable, that's right. not appropriate. And, and it is inappropriate for adoption. Exactly. That would be but, um, but, part of the question. But I will tell you, 90%, if not more, are totally appropriate for adoption. So for me, you know, I'm the big animal lover. I'm the yeah. big heart here. <laughs> well, and then your, your pup is the perfect example yes. of, you know, puts the face on the issue. It does. Yeah. It does. I think I, another issue is that's been very dear to you is water. Water infrastructure. Water infrastructure, oh, yes. and even that you've traveled overseas to learn more about this. Yeah, in 2012 we went to Israel, which yeah. is really a tremendous eye-opener. So tell us more about yeah. that. So uh, the fascinating thing about Israel, you know, we've been talking a lot about water conservation and water reuse here in right. Massachusetts. Um, when you look at water across the country with climate change, yeah. um, we're either having tremendous droughts like you're seeing in California, yeah. you know, which allows fires. the wildfires to, yes. to really... Um, expand or here in Massachusetts we're often more likely seeing heavy intense 
storms, which mm -hmm. means more storm water right. mm. um, runoff. So we went to Israel to kind of see what they're doing and cool. get some learnings. They've, really they've got the very game. shortage, you know, very um, short supply of water. They live in the mm -hmm. desert. They live in the desert. And fascinating statistic, they recycle and reuse 75% of their water, which is incredible. And so I, there's so many things that is both cultural and is also infrastructure related that we just don't do. I mean, when you think about water that goes down your drain from the sink or the faucet, that could actually go back into your toilet tank and be used again to flush. Right. And, and there's so many things, you know, gray water versus drinking potable drinking water versus... And know. they're actually starting to do some of that. Gillette some Stadium is, right. is uh. all piped. And it's a piping issue. Essentially, yeah. you have to have two sets of pipes, which, as you can imagine, it gets expensive. expensive. But mm -hmm. there needs to be a regulatory framework to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. So when you came back from that trip, were there next steps that you were able to do implement here for either your district or statewide that you guys took back from it? Well, one of the things that I did, um, and, and we're granted on the recycling, we're, we're far behind where Israel is, but mm -hmm. um, what we've really been focusing on is replacing the aging infrastructure here in Massachusetts, because Massachusetts, as it is in many cases, was way ahead of the game when it came to, you know, installing some of our water infrastructure. Way back when. <laughs> way back when, but now it's been time to Realizing. replace it. But because it's underground, it just doesn't get the same attention, and so it's always kind of pushed to the back burner, and we're getting to the point where many of our pipes are starting to break or mm. come to the end of their useful life. So we need a more concerted effort to reinvest to maintain those systems. So does that come down to individual municipalities or is that at a state level? Most, in Massachusetts, water infrastructure is primarily funded by locals through okay. the local tax assessment, unlike um, roads and things like yeah, okay. that. But what I filed at the um, state house, which is intended to get to water infrastructure, but also to kind of efficiency and good planning, is to create a parallel fund to what the town gets now from the state called Chapter 90 for roadways, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to create a parallel Chapter 90 fund for the pipes water. under the street. Ah. So you get the pipes replaced, but you do it before you repave the road. road. Yes. So would that be through like Mass DOT? Which is so smart. So it, exactly. Okay. So it would be a reimbursement program where towns would replace their pipes, replace their roadways, and then get reimbursed First for a funds. portion of it by the state. So that would be a bonding issue, and we've been working on that. This is the second session I filed that, and we're, we're still working at it. But it's you know it's a challenging time resource wise, mm. and there are a lot of resources needed across the system. Yeah, right. But we're continuing to push for water because if we don't have the the systems, you right. know, when you to turn on your faucet yeah. and the water right. doesn't come out, yeah. suddenly it's a priority. Right? Exactly. The infrastructure. I mean, what you know, you're all in it in terms of your focus and doing that good work to keep us all safe and healthy and you know being ahead of things. So so much appreciation right. there. Well, transportation, and I, I do yes. want to mention because I'm sure a lot of viewers actually care a lot about the commuter rail. The MBA. Oh, I do. Oh and my one goodness. One of the one of the issues that I've been hearing a lot about in my office recently is really just terrible on-time service of the commuter rail. And mm, you know, still. Mm -hmm. this, the state has really been focusing on it and trying to make some improvements. There's a new contractor that came into place about two years ago, but the service is not, in my view, getting better fast enough. Mm. Is, is it provider? Is it infrastructure? Is it technology? You know, what, yeah. what is it's all it? of the above. I will say that we have, back to the same theme about old infrastructure, mm -hmm. our train system was installed our equipment so, so long ago right, right. that it's really just sort of the it's 18th, 18th <laughs> century technology right, versus right, 21st right. century. Yeah. So we're going to have to chart a path to, to slowly upgrade the infrastructure overall. So right now we're just trying to find more incremental ways to improve service for the people that need it. We spent a lot of time in southern Maine and in Kennebunk there's a um, trolley museum mm. and when you go through it and outside and still running. You are, recognize the train. Are, are, right, and especially since my husband's from Boston he's like that's the same one we had as a kid and stuff even the ones with the wires over the head no. but some of them are still running now yeah. and yeah. that was the thing even, even when they tell you it's like yeah we got this because they decommissioned it but they decommissioned the line not the train itself yeah and so the la line changed so it's kind of it's it really is old. Yeah. Right. So it's well, a process. You're here for that. But we're working on it. We have a legislative delegation, Metro West Caucus, which is a, well, a group of Metro West legislators working and together. And I've had the privilege of living in a variety of communities, and some of them have had better infrastructure than others. And um, to come, you know, in the past 20 plus years I've been in the state. But I've always been frustrated because it's not just the commuter rails, but it's the infrastructure to get people to the commuter rails. 
because you're right now you have to drive and park yeah and yeah. and so it's it's a multifaceted issue of of creating um but i think that would ease. happen anywhere in suburbia i mean that that's you're always going to have to drive to park you're not going to when i well, they call it last mile yeah mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a challenge so so I want to say when I lived in Northern California, I could take a bus to anywhere, including to a train, mm -hmm. and and have the bus service being really close mm -hmm. to where I lived. That even going to the bus, um, and and we're fortunate because we have a lot of commuter rail stations very close to us. But if you go a couple of towns over within your district, getting to the commuter rail. You are, is almost as onerous. Like, well, heck, I'll just drive. And parking there. is very limited. And parking, parking is, is well, yeah. parking is limited, and getting you know if it's it's building then the infrastructure to get people to the commuter rail as well. So it's a it's a it's a. Although I'll tell you, the game there's a game changer on the horizon, and that's um, autonomous vehicles. Yes, and and what's that? Autonomous, autonomous vehicles. vehicles. Oh, okay. And, um, I'm actually. What does that to mean exactly? I'm not even sure. Self-driving cars. Self-driving. Okay. Cars ah, are and buses uh -huh. much more of a reality than I ever, frankly, knew until fairly recently. They're doing experiments, you know, trial runs in Boston. Well, and uh, Pittsburgh has them going, maybe. and San Francisco has them going, and and Uber and Lyft and the shared services. And yeah. it'll be you'll be, yeah. It, it, so I'm the vice chair of transportation committee um, this year, which has been really interesting. Congratulations! Wow. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. This. I mean, I tell you, if I ever hit the lottery, my philanthropic passion is around public transportation and sidewalks. I mean, I would love yeah. to see... And rail trails. And rail, rail trails. trails, exactly. Yes. Uh, you know, we, um, I spent, we lived 14 years in Minneapolis, and um, I don't know if it's still the same, but there was a belief that wherever cars were, there should Sideway. be a footpath, a footpath of some sort. I mean, if you're going to make a road, where do people walk? Right. And they weren't always concrete sidewalks. They were often, paths you know, and trails, paths and trails. Yeah. But you know, definitely for you know, wheels for for pedestrians and bicycles and bicycles. And bicycles absolutely. Big I think that's a big thing. What we're going to see changed here in downtown over the next probably five years is where the sidewalks will go from all the way down to Wood Street from yeah. here. Yeah, it will be there awesome. will be a bike path built into it kind of multi-level right now but I mean it's definitely I mean we're going to be seeing these poles going underground there's going to be a lot of change I mean and in defense of the MBTA as a local who grew up here we've seen it move on out yeah. a lot Thank over the goodness. last 20 years I mean there's been a lot of proactive that has been good with I've been I mean, lucky anytime I, mean, I take the Southboro train I get a parking yeah. spot and it's been fine mm -hmm. I don't go every day but often enough that you know I love as, a, it. as a kid the farthest out west was always Riverside you went to Riverside that's yes. how you got it yeah you drove to Riverside you know so for it to come out and you know it went town by town but I mean now it's all the way out to Worcester yeah yep. yeah yeah yeah, I mean, we need to get people out of their cars is the bottom line. We, yeah. we need to it's create more safe options right. for getting around exactly. within our communities and yes. within the region. Yeah. Yeah. What Very else is good. going on? What yeah. else is going on? Um, so I wanted to bring up, there's something I want to give a shout out to Ron Remillard, who is oh, yes, a yes. local veteran here in mm. Hopkinton, who a number of years ago told me a story about how he could not see a police officer who was directing traffic at a detail. Mm -hmm. And so he approached me and, and raised this as a safety issue, not only That's for the huge. public, but also for police officers. Police officers. Yeah. 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 People can't see or maybe misread a signal. And so he talked to me about, he wanted me to file legislation, which is one of my jobs as a wow. legislator to file on behalf of constituents who come to me, mm -hmm. to file legislation to require police officers to wear white gloves so that folks could see, yes. you know, when they were making hand signals, what they were trying to tell them to do. So Ron and I worked on this legislation. It had its hearing a number of weeks ago, and Ron came in to testify, did a mm -hmm. fantastic job. And really, this, the issue has been getting a lot of attention. And, and, and it's I, simple. And, I think, and it's, it's a simple thing it's that people simple. understand. The transformation. And I think yeah. once like I saw it, you posted it up and things like that, I started noticing it. You know, this community, not as much, but like in Holliston, they're either wearing white or orange gloves. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, and so I was looking now, every, I saw in Framingham, they had white gloves on um, about a week ago. So that, you know, I, it may not be legislation yet, but I think some are like learning, like, I don't want to get hit by a car. It's <laughs> <laughs> just, just another thing. I want to have something reflective on. Yeah. And if they try to hit me, I can throw it at them. <laughs> but the, um, I, I, you know, Sorry. I mean, I sent you a picture of one where I saw, and it was literally around the corner from your home, yeah. and that there were like a ton of officers out there doing some sort of project, and all of them had gloves on. Yeah. 
That's just great. That's just great. Sense. It's just common sense. Exactly. That's so great. I'm hoping we can do something. The, the committee seemed really interested in the issue, and again, Ron made a really compelling oh, case. Wow. Was he, I'm just curious, is he an um, ex-police officer or just a private better. citizen? He's just Be a well, private better, citizen yes, who had a particular experience out in the community and yeah. wanted to do something about yeah. it, which is the best of our right. democracy. Yeah. And Absolutely. I know community. I shared it after you posted it up on um, your page. I shared it over on the Real Housewives page. And I was watching people's different comments, like, you know, Sharon Fontaine, rather, thank God this is happening. Mm -hmm. And so like, and people were, it was very engaging that it's mm -hmm. something that people related to. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we just have a couple minutes, so we need to just give a few shout outs. First of all, this is the, the um, holiday weekend for uh, Halloween. So, yes. you know, that'll be fun Always going out in town. Week, a lot yeah. going no, on. We have week. the uh, Novel Affair Gala That's here tomorrow, at the library right? that we're excited and about. And the ribbon cutting here is in uh, like two hours. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, actually, it'll have already happened by the time the this show. airs. But the, mm -hmm. um, the other things that are happening is that the Metro SY has their event on November 2nd. That's right. Um, Fine event. And but then fun on event, November please 4th, love to have people come the out for that. annual gala called Starry Night, mm -hmm. and they have tons of tickets available. They're really trying to get a push of getting people out there. What's the date on that? It's November 4th. That's right. right. That's and we'll have um, all this up on, so on HCAM. There's a lot going on, and, um, you know, there's a, um, H HCA is also doing a, um, like, a Halloween Jack Lantern 5K um, this weekend, too. So it's a lot. Lots going all on. Good for stuff. And Fall time is wonderful. Fall time. And Beautiful and weather. Having all the fall foods. I love fall. I love. Yeah. There's something about fall that I start to cook. Don't and, we all? And, and, and we know. get just energized around being well, productive it's it's, it's, and just doing fun stuff. You know, it's stuff. everything pumpkin spice. Yeah. And so, I mean, as we go into jack o lantern weekend. <laughs> there you go. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for, Thank you for, Thank you for being with us, Carol. Thanks for having me. This Thanks for being on. Happy autumn. Happy Halloween. Together, we can change the news. Find out how at safekids.org. Mom used to scream about Dad's drinking. It drove me crazy till Mom went to Al-Anon. Is someone's drinking troubling you? You might be surprised at what you can learn in an Al-Anon or Alateen family group from people just like you. Call 1-888-4-AL-ANON or go to alanon.org.